I've got an interesting case. I've been getting lots of cases from overseas, now from Los Angeles, and that's something new, uh, which I've just said. Now, uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman, Yahya Abdul Rahman, he's an expert in RIBA free banking. Now, uh, for our viewers that don't understand the concept, uh, we're going to be talking about that, a bit about his book and the bank uh, that he's involved with the USA that he started. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. No, I think that uh, we have a lot of non Muslim viewers and they, they don't understand. Uh, the concept of riba. So I think that's a good starting point. What do we define as riba? Uh, I've done uh, detailed studies in the Torah and the Bible, and of course the Quran. And uh, riba is the act of lending money at a price called interest rate. And it is called a rebate in the Old Testament and in the Torah. So all three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, consider renting money at a price called interest rate or usually as forbidden because it leads to the abuse of people's rights using the power of money. So, so that's the concept of riba in the end of the day. It's uh, basically what, which we sort of call usually in the end of the day. Well, um, if you look at money, it's a medium of exchange. Uh, you cannot eat money, you cannot rent, you cannot uh, drink money, you cannot cover yourself with money, but you can buy food and drink and cover with money. So money is a medium of exchange. And it cannot be rented because it's fungible. If I give you a hundred dollar bill or a hundred rand bill, you will go and use it for your needs. And if I ask you for the same hundred rand bill, you will say, well, I don't have it, but I have another hundred. And that's not the term of renting something. When you rent a car, you have to bring back to me the same car. Great. And so on and so forth. So money is like a loaf of bread. I cannot rent you a loaf of bread. I can give you a loaf of bread and it becomes yours. I cannot rent you an apple. I can give you an apple and it becomes yours because the minute it's used, it changes its nature. And that is the same with money. So when I give you money, it's an investment with you. And this uh, practice that's being used with conventional banks, giving you the impression that you can come to my office or my bank and ask for 200,000 rand to buy a home at a certain rental rate, rate of 6% is a concept that is faulty and may be counterproductive because in real based banks, they rent money in riba free banks or Islamic banks, actually we invest money. And because you invest money, you always worry about the prudence of that investment. Does it make economic sense? Does it give you an acceptable rate of return? If it does, we'll embark on it. If it doesn't, then we'll stop and look for something else. Now you're sort of known for riba free banking. Now, we know that we have a capitalist system that goes on it, and there's lots of uh, issues around the world, that, and the world is subscribed to sort of mainly one sort of banking, and that's interest. And then you talk about interest free banking, riba free banking. How does that plug into this entire big picture? And what are some of the challenges around that? It plugs in as an alternative system, and uh, it serves a capitalistic system, but it plugs in with a niche, and the niche is to test the economic viability of what you want to embark on when you invest money. So when you go and buy a home, uh, in addition to negotiating uh, rates of uh, interest rates in a bank and so on, you need to measure if the investment makes economic sense by measuring the rental rate of a similar home in the neighborhood and taking that rental rate and using it to measure the rate of return on investment. So if the rate of return on investment is high enough, you will invest. If it is very low, you will not invest. And no conventional bank does this. All they do, you go to them, they will give you $200,000 at 6% for 20 years, and the unknown will be the monthly payment, and that's the contract. Uh, your house went down, the neighborhood went down, whatever happens, you owe me this money, it's $200,000, and that's it. If you go to a river free bank, it will tell you, 
ways the house if you want to buy, how much does it rent for, and we start calculating the rate of return on investment. If it is high enough, we will invest with you and will encourage you to invest. If it is much lower, we will invite you to look for another house because this investment doesn't make economic sense. Of course. I want to decrease a little bit and just take one step backwards. You as a person, uh, you seem very entrenched in, in what you are doing and you, you're an expert at what you are doing. Um, how, where did all of that come from? Uh, did you find that there was a need for what you're doing in terms of working within this niche? Uh, because you're up against lots of odds when you're talking about going against all these yeah. banks and, uh, and the system. Um, what drove you to do that and get into that? Well, uh, from a religious standpoint, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, a uh, person has to fulfill his uh, spiritual and religious beliefs. And uh, as a Muslim, I know that the Quran uh, prohibits riba. And I know that it's the worst and most heinous act a person can do. Charging riba, or usually, and taking riba, or usually, and witnessing riba, or usually, uh, are one are some of the most heinous uh, offenses a Muslim can do. And I wanted to dig deeper to find out if it is in Judaism and Christianity, and I found out it's not only in Judaism and Christianity and Islam, but Plato has forbidden it, Buddhism has forbidden it, and so on and so forth. So the, the motivation for that was that when we came to America uh, about 50 years ago, we had our colleagues who refused to participate in riba-based banks. And they said we would rather live in apartments. And they had their families crowding small little apartments. And they deprived their families from having a nice car, uh, living in a nice neighborhood to go to the schools. And uh, we wanted to have an alternative to solve the problem of these people that I call the Puritans and his was Leiva, and that is the American Finance House. And you can read more about it at www.lariba, L-A-R-I-B-A. We will have those details on the screen for our viewers. We'll have those details on, on the screen for Yeah, viewers. that's very really good. That's very really nice. So we, we uh, started it with a small investment. And of course, uh, people, uh, we're wondering if this is a crazy idea, if it will ever fly, if it will be successful, if it will be accepted. And with uh, tedious work, uh, taking care of the meticulous details and having the commitment to proceed, uh, the Almighty God, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has helped us achieve uh, wonderful results in 28 years. We've been at it for 28 years. And we started with $200,000. I went to my friends and I said, you know, put in $10,000 or $20,000. And we raised $200,000 in 1987. And in Lebanon, 1987. And um, we started the process. Uh, today, uh, 28 years later, um, we serve all 50 states. We own a full service uh, national bank in the United States. And we have total assets uh, that we service uh, loans uh, of about $500 million by the grace of Allah. We have a capital. That's quite that considerable. Uh, it's quite considerable for, for sort of going into a niche market. That means within this niche market, there is obviously a greater market within that. There is tremendous amount of market potential in this field. And what we're doing now, we, we, we are uh, trying to call this alternative form of banking as something that's more inclusive because uh, we found that if you call it Islamic banking then everybody else will think it's only for the Muslims. Great. I think that that's a problem because you, you sort of marginalize the entire concept. Exactly. And, and uh, so we decided to call it Lima Free and then we decided to promote it and brand it with a brand called RF Banking. R stands for Riba or Ribbit Free and F is Free. 
And um, this way you can open it up to everybody else. <laughs> I always uh, tell people who object around, how come you take the word Islamic out? That's, that's, that's not nice. I say, well, imagine uh, Barclays Bank changed its name to the Christian Bank of England or the UK. Well, they they to to try, to try to operate in uh, Kashmir or in, um, in, in India or in, uh, in Pakistan or in uh, Cairo, Egypt, and so on and so forth. So we need to be sensitive to other people, and we need to use this wonderful concept and discipline as a window for people to work together of all faith, all colors, all backgrounds, all languages. And if we really are serious about what we claim, then uh, we believe, so our beliefs should gauge and form our behaviors and our way of transacting, then we will be noticed by everybody who may not be a Muslim. And this way we can be the servants of the community uh, without any competition. Great. Jonathan, you, you, you're definitely passionate about what you do. And, and one sort of perceives that when I notice that your thing with, with quite a thick book uh, that you wrote, that tell us a bit about that book. Um, uh, I authored actually three books. In 1994, I authored a very thin, tiny, 100 page book, which was based on my readings in the Libra Free Financing, and I called it Lenny Bank. That was self published, and we distributed about 7,000 copies of that book, so it's not a small amount. And then in uh, 2008, I had a call from uh, John Wiley, which is one of the largest uh, publishers in the United States and the world. And he said that we're looking for an American who would author a book on Sharia finance. And I, I told him that the title is not good. Because we said, why Sharia finance? Well, of course, we did a survey and we asked average Americans when you hear the word Sharia, what comes to your mind? It was uh, chopping hands, uh, polygamy, and, 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 so I said, we're not going to call it this one. It took us about six months of negotiating, and we decided to call it the Art of Islamic Banking Finance, and that was published in 2010. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, we did two printings, sold out, it was on the bestsellers list on Amazon.com, and John Wiley called me and said, we need to have another edition, which is so the second edition. That there was a cross-section of people purchasing the book. Yes. It wasn't only coming from the Muslim community. No, many non-Muslims, actually. Uh, the majority came from Asia, China, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, India, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so now we have the uh, second edition. Which is the and I see it's gone much thicker than uh, it's much thicker and uh, and more expanded and it is designed to also be used as a textbook with questions at the end of every chapter and these questions are answered on a website so it comes with a website attached to it as an experiment first time used by a publishing uh, company uh, it has uh, chapters which are included for the first time in history of uh, writing about riba free financing, and that is the prohibition of riba uh, or interest in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so the interesting dynamics that you sort of brought in together, uh, because I mean, as you mentioned earlier, um, that uh, the doctrines of riba free was not only from Islam, but it came from all the other religions. Exactly. And, and I think it was having to make that known to people. Yes, and, and, and actually, when we wrote about it in the other religions, we asked experts and in their fields who belong to the same religion. So when they present the concept and so on, they present it from their point of view and the vantage point. And then we make the comments on it. So that is the chapter. And then another chapter about valuation. What is the value of something that you buy in the market? and how you make sure that it is not overpriced, it is not suffering from a bubble pricing situation. 
And uh, that is a very important uh, chapter because with, with, with this analysis, which is based on the hadith of the Rasul and the, the discipline of the Rasul uh, we have uh, projected the decline in gold prices and the decline in oil prices. And as well, just to say, it is in print in the book, actually printed four years ago. And, uh, and then we developed a model of how to finance River Free, which we have tested in the United States for the past 28 years, and we've been perfecting it and improving upon it. And it's a model that would satisfy the requirements of the local laws in the United States and banking regulations, and at the same time does not violate the Sharia or the jurisprudence, which by the way, I call in the book the Judeo-Christian Islamic law. And which, is I call it law. Uh, which is interesting because I, I think that when you put it in that perspective, um, I think it becomes within perspective for everyone to see and feel. Yeah. And, and that's where the problem is, we're not sort of communicating uh, these, these connections that we have with the other communities. That's correct. And via that, I think that we're creating another connection that's correct. that we need to see. You know, uh, in, in most Western societies, they, they of course, uh, are very proud of the fact that these societies were built based on the Jewish Christian value system. But, but then the Muslims have arrived and are making contributions. Uh, to uh, developments, to civilizations, and, and, and. So it's time to expand the Judeo Christian terminology into a Judeo Christian Islamic terminology. And that chapter actually details the foundation upon which we, we say this. I think that's quite pioneering. Now that you've come to South Africa, uh, I know that you are doing some lectures, seminars, that kind of thing. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, uh, actually, it was uh, in your first visit, actually. Yeah, Regents Business School, uh, which is a, a very active and fast-growing institution, invited me to present uh, the book in the form of a breakfast uh, briefing uh, for about an hour and a half, which was uh, very well attended and also attended by the Ambassador uh, Consul General of the United States in Durham. And uh, also, we're doing a master class, which was repeated in Johannesburg, and now we are carrying it to... Um, so, so would you say then that South Africans are, are latching on to what you're saying? Well, we do have some banks, like the Albarica Bank, obviously, yes. uh, that, that offer similar product line. Uh, but do you think that South Africans are coming to terms with the yes. free banking? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm very happy to report that the reception was very, very positive. Because what we are doing, we're uncovering uh, facts about river free banking for the first time. We're presenting it in a format that we hope would be very attractive, not only to the Muslims, but to uh, people who do not belong to the Islamic faith of all religions and backgrounds. Where do you see this going in the future? Uh, I understand that. The work that you're doing is a very complex environmental, as we, we as, as South Africans, we understand that, that the West and America could be a bit more challenging when it comes to Islamic ideology and philosophy, based on some of the things that we're seeing and feeling in the media. So, so you're in a, in a very strategic space, in our view. Uh, and in South Africa, I think we're a bit more liberal to certain things yeah. with Islam and that sort of thing. Uh, although I do think yeah. to have very clear-cut democracies, and both are de democratic in any sense. But where do you see this going in the future within the context of your country and oh. that of South Africa? Well, the future is very promising. Uh, I mean, uh, the good news are not out yet, but uh, our children who were born and raised in the United States and the West in general uh, are uh, graduating from the best colleges and universities in the world. They are big achievers at the highest levels. Uh, they are commanding top positions in the mid and upper management and soon will be at the helm of many uh, hospitals and corporations and uh, different uh, companies on Wall Street. So the good news are coming, uh, I, I promise you. But when we present river free banking as an alternative banking discipline, uh, we need to be very careful not to exclude others. 
Because we love to know who you are, what good intentions you represent. And somebody comes and deals with you and he feels or she feels that she's been excluded. They will never forget, forget that. They will never forgive that. So we need to be sensitive uh, to the fact that when we present our discipline, our way of life, then we have to present it in a way that does not exclude people. This whole concept that we've been talking about is wrapped around a very important foundation, and that's a movement to invite people to live, live a free. And by this we mean living within your means. By this we mean don't overuse credit cards and never use the plastic as a credit card, use it as a charge card. And there's a world of difference between a charge card and a credit card. A charge card is a card that you use to buy what you need and make sure that you pay it before the end of the month. A credit card is a card by which you create instant loans. And these are the most expensive kind of loans. We want to, to, to lead a river free lifestyle that actually looks at the person as a valuable contributor and judge the person by his or her contributions, not by the looks, you know, oh look, he's wearing Good. a very expensive designer suit or a designer jeans or an expensive body shoe and so on and so forth, an expensive watch or he's driving an expensive Beamer or a Mercedes and so on and so forth. All of these things may be impressive in the beginning, but actually in the, in the bottom line is what makes the difference is you, who you are, what are your contributions, and how you make a difference in my life. And that's the kind of lifestyle that we want to promote and publicize around this movement of Lima Free Friends. That's very interesting advice coming from you because normally when one speaks to bankers that come from a capitalist environment, that's not the kind of advice that they get to yes. give people. So the fact that you're giving us that advice is very interesting because uh, it, it speaks to, to people that are living real lives, people that are living real situations. And people do walk into the mall and they do see shiny gold and silver and they do swipe those credit cards and they do get into debt and they wear those things wandering out of to pay that in the end of the month. And so what you're saying makes lots of sense. The last piece of advice to our youth watching the show, uh, what direction should they be taking? Um, with their finances uh, as they go along in their lives? Uh, there are a number of uh, reminders uh, for the youth. Uh, whenever you go to a college, please do not take student loans. That's an interesting and, uh, and, and the reason we say that is because uh, in the United States, the average uh, student graduates from college with a $65,000 to $100,000 student loan. And that's a lot of money to start your life with. You will always be under the water, regardless what the rate is, and so on and so forth. Uh, we started in America with nothing. We washed dishes, we cleaned floors, and we worked part-time in the library, we worked part-time as teaching assistants. And we advise our youth who call in for student loans to please get a part-time job. And even if you want to graduate in four years, maybe six years, but graduate without a student loan. Uh, that's the, 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 the biggest advice and reminder that I want to tell my sons and daughters and grandchildren uh, before I leave town. Uh, the other advice is, you know, uh, what makes you cool is who you are, the way you talk, the way you interact with people, not the way you dress or the way you look. It is you and you need to train people to evaluate you this way. You need to hang out with people who respect you and what you say because of who you are, not because of the way you dress, or because they can give you a ride in a Beamer, or because they can give you a ride in a Mercedes, or they can take you to a big uh, place to spend money, and so on and so forth. And, and become a committed worker to change the lives of people. And, uh, and, and that is something that's very important, to touch people's hearts, to touch people's minds, to touch people's pockets by showing them how to live happily, 
without overspending and over digging themselves into a deep pit of debt. Dr. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been an interesting one. I actually enjoyed the, the last piece specifically because I think the advice is real on the ground for your people. And coming from the banking sector, one would not uh, sort of expect that sort of advice. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Dr. Verlachan, some interesting advice. Uh, you've got to book out all the details at the bottom of the screen and on my website, fraisalsay.com. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.